Welcome back to the Light Podcast. <laughs> Welcome back. Welcome back to the Lion Podcast. My name is Aaron Alexander. This is a place that we bring together the world's leading experts in all things health and wellness to help you optimize your mind and your body and your movement. And on occasion, probably various topics beyond that. This conversation was with my good friend, Kyle Kingsbury. Kyle is a ex- retired UFC fighter. One of his most notorious moments, I think, in the UFC was where he got up in the weigh-ins. I don't remember who he was fighting exactly, but Rogan was there and the whole crew, and he pulled off his pants and he had some kind of gay pride bikini thing on. So that's the kind of guy that Kyle is. He's a badass, he's incredibly intelligent, and he has a, a broad swath of knowledge that circulates through his mind and is really fantastic to get to dive in to the vibrant, sparkling, divine pools, Kyle Kingsbury's synaptic juice in this conversation. Clearly feeling goofy right now. I don't know what it is. I think I had excessive amounts of coffee, but here we are. I hope you devour this conversation. We discuss psychedelics. We discuss depression. We discuss what the heck is going on in the world in the present moment. Per mention, Kyle's one of my closest friends, and we do not always agree on things, which I greatly value that we can nudge up against each other. Sometimes he says things and I push back. Sometimes it's the inverse, and that's how we sharpen our own perspectives. So I hope that you have friends and people and media and uh, resources like that in your own life, because the only way to really understand what you're thinking is to be around people that challenge it. So that's it. That's all. If you guys enjoyed this conversation, I hope you feel inclined to share it. You could also leave reviews on the iTunes or wherever you listen to this. And uh, I think that's it. I appreciate you very much. I hope you devour this conversation. Here we go. Back to the program with the man, the myth, the legend, Kyle Kingsbury. Bow. We're, uh, I want to set the stage. I always uh, try to do this. I don't know if you, you, you must, maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe your listeners are used to it, but I'm not always in front of an ocean. It was a couple episodes ago. Uh, you're going to hear that. You're going to hear birds. You might hear these awesome cicadas in a tree next to us. And if we're lucky, We'll get the howler monkeys mm. to come on. Yep. Um, you also might hear some people since we're in a house with like 10, 12 fucking amazing people here. We're in Costa Rica for fit for service and each other's company. That's right. Typically on mine, we're awkwardly sitting in a, a fairly tight sauna with people that are typically unprepared for the sauna. <laughs> <laughs> like, you have much experience with this? They're like podcasting or sweating. <laughs> Neither. <laughs> <laughs> embodied cognition is a is a thing that I find uh, an interesting topic in relation to to uh, the sauna and conversations. And here, you know, we're out here in the ocean. We have the sun and the cicadas and uh, each other. It's a part of it. The, the the texture of the couch that we're on, all of those inform the way that we think and feel and perceive the world. So when you're with someone and you, you know, the, you've, you've heard of the study. I think we've probably talked about this a bunch of times, but you're holding like an icy beverage. You, you heard no, of this? No, 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 no. Yeah, so there's been, there's been research in the realm of embodied cognition, various, various different things. There's like a clipboard study and... and Explain, hold on, backtrack. Explaining yeah. embodied con- cognition, please. Im, yeah, embodied. So your body, how that informs your, your cognition. So your physical felt experience with this tissue, skin bag, situation and your senses and such, how that informs the way that you process information. And so when you are holding an icy beverage, so says research, it will actually start to augment your perception of the world around you to be a little bit colder. So what they did with this is they were doing interviews with people for jobs and they found that when they were when they gave them an icy beverage to the interviewers, they would perceive the interviewees as being like, oh, he was a little cold. He was a little kind of closed. But then you give him like, you know, a, a warm cup of tea and a nice big soft bowl with like Winnie the Pooh on or whatever. You're like, oh, you have that warm, open 
humorous. They didn't have any poop. Then you perceive the person differently. This, the interviewer perceived the interviewee. Yeah. Based on the temperature they had in their hand. Yeah, it was the same thing with clit words. Well, that's you, interesting. It's, so this is why this is why you get you know ripped off when getting like a fancy business card. You know, so oh wow, I'm gonna get a, each business card costs three dollars. It's gonna really make an impression. You know, and it's built on fucking titanium, platinum, whatever. And you give somebody that, it's all you drop the business card down. You're like, this person's weighty. American psycho. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but the reason I say that is it's it's, it's it's always interesting to me how our environmental conditions inform our uh, our identity structure, our felt experience, our perception and filter in the world. And so this one, our personalities will express a little bit differently likely than if we were, you were back I'm on Rogan's podcast. I'm still trying podcast. to clarify this. So like if it, I, I, would, I could see how it would impact the, the person being interviewed because it's affecting the temperature at their hand. Mm -hmm. Warm being opening... Cold being constricting. Yeah. So if it was a cold drink in their hand, they may share less. And if it's a warm drink in their hand, they may share more and be more open about themselves. It would it would be but bidirectional. For the, for the inner okay, bidirectional. It would right. be it would certainly be bidirectional. It'd be, it'd be a funny judgment for me to be like, this fucking son of a bitch marched in here for an interview with a cold soft drink in his hand. Oh yeah. You're out. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, yeah, it would be, I, I think that the way that you would and obviously like with any research, it's like there was a bias by the researchers and over just 50% to observe of them. It, quantum yeah, level. Yeah. yeah. So it's just an interesting thing to pursue. Like take the research, I think any study, I think people that are there, that are excessively, you know, quotatious in the realms of like studies, like everything's a study, a study, a study. Sometimes it's like, okay, well, that's also all of that is someone else's bias mm -hmm. that you're now regurgitating. So taking a study like that is like just a, a little kernel to be like, oh, interesting. Is there something there? And now check in. You know, next time you're hanging out with somebody, maybe a girlfriend or a guy friend, how do you feel with that person when you're on like a fluffy couch? How do you feel with that person when it's way too cold in the room? How do you feel with that person when it's warm in the room? How do you feel with that person when there's bright blue lights coming down? How do you feel that person when there's candles? Mm -hmm. All of that is embodied cognition. That's and savage. you can leverage that as a really powerful tool. I love that. Yeah, you set the table with it. Yeah, there's definitely a feel. I mean, anyone who's been... To Central and South America knows there's a different feel there. But Costa Rica has its own resonance. Yeah. It's a really special place. My first time up north, kind of bounced around all over the place the first week I was here with my mom back in 2015. And then last trip was to Soltara. But we're in the, the last stages of dry season. There were some forest fires going when we drove in. Definitely dry, arid, even though you see all this lush green here next to the ocean. There's just a fucking vibe. You know, it's, it's a really cool place to be. Yeah. And to, to feel that. And I think that's something I always have gratitude for in an altered state of consciousness is like a felt understanding, a visceral knowing, as opposed to just a cognitive knowing. Yeah. And, and minus any drug or psychedelic or altered state of consciousness. I mean, fuck, the breath work we did before this was altering our state. state love. Change. Love. You fall in love. Ooh, yeah. It's drugs. State change, right? Yeah. But that, there's a visceral feel here and it's very relaxing. And, uh, yeah, fully recognizing too how many people aren't traveling right now. So I want to acknowledge that, but it's fucking awesome. Yeah. It is an awesome feel. I think with just to follow the thread of the environment, shifting, shaping the way that we think and feel. Last night, we went to this East Forest show that was absolutely blew my mind. And during that, one of the things that was coming up for me was the, the value and they were talking about it. So I don't I think it was coming up for everyone because they were suggesting it comes up for us. But uh, the value of intentionality you know, and I think it's it's easy to think we're maybe we're into, you know, ultimately how you do anything is how you do everything, probably. But we're intentional about certain things, but we can kind of throw other things as like, oh, it doesn't really matter. And you know, it may be really intentional about maybe your business or maybe a specific relationship, but then you come back and your home is a wreck. You know, or maybe you're not very specific or intentional about your geographical location in the world or the, the people you're spending time with or any of that. It's an interesting thing, almost like a self audit. You know, when you walk into your room, really look around and say, how does this room inform the way that I think and the way that I feel, the way that I perceive myself? Do I walk in and it's kind of like in disarray? You know, it's like, okay, cool. I'm like a disarray kind of guy. And then also I'm having disarray kind of guy. I'll also, have, also having acceptance and love for that. There's no one specific way to live life that is any better or worse but hopefully you are at least sovereign enough to engage with the choice of what you want to create. 
And you have the awareness to see that That's there right. are choices around that. Yeah. That's right. It's the the recognition of there's there's a perceptive feel in my environment that impacts the way that I feel, think, and operate. Yeah. And it can be as simple as a state change through breath work or as simple as rearranging the room. Before I left, Paul Check got me this amazing birthday present. It's a statue of Cernanos, who is the Celtic god of nature. Mm. And he's he's powerful. I saw him at at Check's down for the Mandala painting workshop and um, immediately was drawn to him. Like just fucking, I was like, wow. And of course he sensed that and hooked me up with this incredible fucking present for my birthday. And so um, I had already felt my altar in disarray, you know, and I, I kind of told Tosh like, hey, you know, oh, this is fucking way too busy. Yeah. And we consolidate this is like, oh yeah, I've thought that for a while. And then, uh, you know, I went to work one day, I came back and the, the room was completely redone with Serenos up there. And so that's how I left. And that's what I get to return to. Yeah. And I just have tons of gratitude, not only for Tosh, but and Jack and everything else, but like that, the understanding, the understanding that with that awareness, we can change something slightly and it's never perfect or it's perfect for only a short while. And then you have adjustments to make yeah. as with anything, but like that recognition allows that to happen. So I don't just walk into my room and feel like oh, something's off. Yeah. You know, like I can make it, I can, we get to choose how to make it from within our own personal kingdom to the kingdom of relationship, to the kingdom of home and our every environment we're in and still accept the things we can't change about it. Yeah. You know, with the, the psychedelic conversation, something that I've heard from somebody else of, you know, who said, beware of knowledge unearned. It was someone, it was like someone pretty clever. Beware of knowledge unearned. Beware of knowledge unearned. No, but I like that. Yeah. And I think that's a lot of like, like the psychonaut space, you know, where it's like people getting hot and bothered about doing all the ayahuasca and all the DMT and all the, just all the things and kind of wearing that as a badge. You're like, oh, cool. Like I did the thing. So now I've, I've did the work. It's like, I feel like you have more depth, way more depth in this conversation than I do. But it almost feels like to me, the work is outside of that space where you do arrange your environment in a way that suits the ideal of what you're intending to create. And you do arrange your relationships and you do arrange your career and your financial situation and your family and all that. That's like, okay, I'm out in the world. I'm doing the work to actually build this house. And then perhaps the psychedelic experience is with that, it's more of like a, a yin, feminine, I'm, I'm doing the letting go. It's now it's like, and the listening, right? And, like, well, yeah. Whatever downloads you get comes doing, from listening. Yeah. So yeah. Doing, ideally, you're not doing the lingo. I'm just kind of being cute with language. But yeah. But that's like, okay, like, I he, I'm there's no doing. I'm I'm just surrendering and being and listening and. Uh, but that's not the the work. That's a part of the work. But then it's like, okay, now what do you do with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a step. It's a stage in the work. Yeah. Um, it's not a stage in the integration. Integration comes after. Yeah. And that you know. For, through all the talks around integration, it's like w very pragmatically, it's what steps have you taken to change your life significantly? Yeah. You know? And if it's if it was just a letting go process or healing from something in the past, cool, but then how did that change your relationship with the person whom that happened with? Or how did that change your relationship towards yourself? How has your self-talk, your internal dialogue shifted mm -hmm. from before to now? Like there's many ways to track that stuff, but it all comes down to putting feet on the ground. Have you had any specific stumbling blocks that you continually come back to over the last one, five, 10, 20 years where you're like, oh, I thought I had that. And it's like, it's still a returning pattern. Um, man, the negative, the negative mental loops from my solo cast in December, well, the solo cast is recent, but the, the five MEO Sonoran Desert Toad in, in December, that continued for a while. You know, I, my listeners will know, but, but for your listeners, I went through like a 17 day journey from one experience with the snoring desert toad. And so uh, it's the only medicine where, to my knowledge, where you can have reactivations to the degree of your experience. So whatever your dose was, you can go to that depth in your dream state or in meditation. And oftentimes it's not willingly. It's like fucking here you go. And uh, that was that was for sure the hardest experience of my life. But it started to blend the waking dream with uh, the sleeping dream. Were you underslept at that time or not at all? I was completely underslept when it started. So after the ceremony, I think December 7th, lasted 17 days. And the first three nights I didn't sleep because I, I didn't want to go back there alone. Whoa. 
I was like, nope, I surrender to not sleeping. I don't surrender to going back to hell without other people guiding, you know, mm-hmm. without a support system. And um, wow. didn't even want to bring it up to Tosh. You know, like, I can't, I'm losing my mind. I can't tell her that. And yet at the same time, she's so intuitive and knows me better than anyone. She's like, what the fuck is going on? So that, that caused a chain reaction to finally get a hold of Paul Check. We talked for two hours on Christmas Eve. He taught me how to ground it. Fucking rest is history. If you want more, listen to the solo cast. How do you ground it? He had a closing ceremony that he offered for me to bridge the gap. And this is, this is good for um, your listeners too. Like, really, you want to close the ceremonies. You know, if you go to a, Ayahuasca Soltara, they know they're going to sing Icaros that close the circle each night. And they, you know, closing circle at the end of your fourth night, the next day is going to be a part of that experience too. For some of the other stuff that goes on stateside and things like that, like we don't, I've never typically closed a mushroom journey or a DMT journey or any of those things. So Mm. it was really important to do that. And part of the grounding process is speaking things into existence using the logos, that vibration that calls from the mental, emotional, and astral realms back into 3D reality through vibrations, through the word. So speaking aloud everything I've learned after a fucking proper saging in a hot bath with 12 drops of frankincense, everything I've learned from the darkness, how it's going to change my life, how I vow to operate differently because of that, and perhaps most importantly, asking God to bridge the gap to my soul or high self, to my small self, so Kyle Kingsbury understands it without anyone else's help. What needs to change going forward? If there's any other lessons, please bring it to me in my dreams without fear so I can stay asleep and actually start to restore my body and sanity. And it worked, you know, <laughs> no doubt. It, it worked very well. I had super psychedelic dreams, no fear, slept like a baby first night, Christmas Eve. And uh, first night in 17 days, you know, I'm getting questions about this from Fit for Service members. The most common questions are, the specifics of the negative thought loops. And it's not, it's not so much the specifics that matter. Like, I, I don't mind people's curiosity. It is, the way I would explain it is more on a general approach to thought in, to thought. Yeah. So when we, if we're driving a car and we have a thought train that we're tracking, generally we seek to resolve an idea or a path forward. Like we're looking to track something. So it's like, hmm, is it this or is it that? Oh, okay, I think it's this. Yeah, that resonates. All right, well then, then what about this and this? You know, and we kind of go through these little steps of polarity that can guide us to a way forward. And what I was finding in that experience was that rather than guiding me to a path forward, it would guide me in a way that kind of slowly circled back to the very beginning thought. And I would catch myself back at the beginning and be like, fuck, no, like I'm stuck. And it was always negative. It would invert any spiritual teaching I've ever had that was positive and invert it to the negative. It was polarity at its most extreme. And how do you define negative and positive in that that context? Um, Negative meaning either left me with a feeling of fear or disharmony or pointlessness and meaninglessness. What is my existence? What is the root of that fear or bigger, less tangible question, fear itself? The root. I'm not, I don't, if I'm there not, is a root, maybe there's a root. Yeah, I'm not sure. Root, I mean, there was like on 30 grams of mushrooms, there was a very, I, I understood the first layers of hell yeah. as things I was consciously afraid of. My wife and I had already miscarried. So I was very afraid of us miscarrying with Wolf. Very afraid of that. So like to live through her doing that in the most gruesome fucking right. 16K you know, blood going into my mouth from her exploding. Like, that was fucking gnarly. Yeah. And on an infinite loop until I finally didn't care. Then I move on to the next. Like, in hindsight, it's like, oh, of course. Yeah, man, I fucking really feared that. But this is digging up shit that I hadn't, I hadn't even thought of. It was like real time finding ways. Like, have you thought of this? That would suck. You know, like, yeah, that's your existence. Like, <laughs> just yeah. fucking sorting through every kind of fear. I think, I think the ultimate lesson in that experience was something that, you know, most of the sages and saints from the East talk about is that you're not your thoughts. Mm -hmm. You know, it's if I believe in the fucking thought, if I attach to the thought, now I'm really along for the ride of that thought. Thoughts are like a TV channel. Yeah. Channel 34, channel 39. And this was channel 666, so it was gnarly. You know what I'm saying? It was was really gnarly. Um, but, But, you know, a few days ago, even before coming out here, and my plan was to have my prescription ketamine nasal spray at East Forest. 
You know, like that was going to be my first time journeying at any level. It was a, you know, moderate level, but my first time really journeying since last December, which is, you know, it's, it's, you know, I've taken years off since my first ayahuasca ceremony. I've gone nearly two years in between ceremonies. It's not like I'm back to the wishing well consistently, but this was a good break for me to integrate this, but still a question mark kind of looming like, oh, how am I going to, how am I going to feel into this? And so a few days before coming here, while I was driving Bear to school, the thought loop came up. And that was the first time where the negative thought loop came and I was able to just witness it and kind of, oh, there you are, old friend. Yeah, right. You know, man, it's been a while. Holy shit. You know, the, the fear in that is wondering, is this always with me now? Or is this never going to change? Or will it ever go back to normal? And it's like, I had experienced enough normal for me to understand that, yes, this is likely with me. And, and this likely was probably already with me. I just didn't have the awareness of it. You know, it likely was already there that I overthought things or, or, you know, overworried over shit that's out of my control in the future. And, you know, one thing I brought up on the podcast was, you know, the, the explicate informing the implicate, the implicate informing the explicate, as above, so below, you know, as within, so without. And Kind of like embodied cognition in a yeah, way. Yeah, brother. Yeah, your environment it's like I'm, I, I, What I'm looking at, I don't watch the news, but man, I'm I'm pretty clued in on you know, some of the things that are going on in the world that don't resonate with me. And, and for, for people that haven't listened to the guests that I've had on, you know, in the last six months, it's totally fine. Fundamentally, what lockdowns meant for me was the people that are in control of what we do in everyday life, who have, they're pushing us all to agree upon a set of ideas that don't resonate. That's not my lived experience. I don't fear nature. I don't fear my environment. I don't think the boogeyman's going to fucking take me out. I take care of my body, and that's reflected to me. And if I get sick, I fucking get over it, and I'm better for it. I've lived that experience, and that's not going to change due to something mutating or some shit like that, or something made in a lab or anything otherwise. I'm not afraid of it, and I'm not afraid of nature. Yeah. You know, but to have that impact my life and everyone I know, their lives, um, there's a certain powerlessness in that. And, uh, you know, the more I was digging into what that looks like in the future, potentially, of where the, these things want to go. And it's not just conjecture. It's from some of the, uh, you know, the Bill Gates of the world, the Klaus Schwab's from the World Economic Forum. What they're saying in advance of what they want to get things to is not where I want to fucking go. And at the same time, it's with that awareness and recognition and the serenity prayer of knowing what I, you know, what I'm in charge of. And what I have control over, I'm going to focus on that. And the things that are out of my control, I'm not going to let it bother me. It's circling back to that that allows me to live and operate as I do right now. I'm still wrapped up in the root of fear. And I wonder... I'm just saying that that impacted my ceremony. Yeah. Or, without fucking question. Yeah, yeah. Without question. But so that's... So that with that, I, I wonder if it's... I wonder what fear looks like in a mind and body that's in full, complete, utter acceptance of death. Like not in a, in a oh, I say it intellectually, but I'm truly like, oh, like I'm, I'm really unattached. Like not disassociated right, and, but, and despondent so, so. and apathetic, <laughs> but like I could be here in this form or uh, another. And then the, 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 the steps to getting to that point, again, not in an apathetic, despondent, depressed, disconnected way, in a deeply, deeply connected way. Yeah, like Hoka, hey, today yeah. is a good day to die. Like yeah. I've done, I've, there's no stone left unturned. I have made peace with my life and peace with those around me. And, and if I go today, it's a good day. Which ultimately probably comes back to my, my guess would be if you opened yourself up to as much love as you were able to, to give and receive. I would think for myself, if I lived with a, a constricted capacity to, to love and be loved, and then I was on my moment of like car spinning out, I'm gone. And I, and I didn't really allow Full anyone surrender. else in, myself in. I'd be like, fuck. <laughs> you know, I'd be like, damn it. Like that was my go. <sighs> no, but I would think that you don't necessarily need to run for, you know, president of Costa Rica or something like that to like live your best life. Like I think that you could just in an instant right now, live your best life through dropping that protection enough and, and armor and, and defense mechanisms enough to say like, oh, okay, like I'm, I'm truly free. And, that, and I can hear myself saying some of these things and not fully embodying it because I'm still in, in my own process. 
You know what I'm saying? Right. But I, I just wonder. I wonder if that's... Yeah. I have no fear of death, personally. Um, there are things that are far worse than death. Yeah. There is torture that happens. There are, you know... I mean, this isn't just, you know, reading shit on Gab or... What was the other one that got taken down? The the right wing site that fucking Amazon, Google, and and uh, iTunes took out. I don't know. I don't know. Whatever the I'm fucking not, site was, attention. people know. Um, it's not you know like like the. It's not just hearing Alex Jones talk about kids and sexual trafficking and things like that. It's like talking to like a Tim Kennedy, mm -hmm. you know, who who knows that. Not only is that real, but there are people on this planet right now who, once they're kidnapped, will be forced to have sex. They'll be raped for 16 hours a day mm. with eight hours of sleep until they die, until their body gives out. Whoa. It's that understanding that the darkness is here, and um, there are things that are worse than death. And I, I don't particularly, as a six-foot-three former fighter worry about that in myself and I don't particularly worry about that with my family and my kids um, there's just things worse than death so it's not for me just the I'm cool with dying it's it's you know what systems get put in place under the fallacy of safety from something we should not be afraid of you know I think anybody who has a, a decent enough experience in nature with medicines or not understands like, yeah, nature is metal. Fucking there's things that can eat your ass and life eats life to live. And at the same time, that's not the thing to fucking be afraid of. We, we can come into harmony and resonance within our environment and, and live in that resonance and not fear nature. Like there, there's fucking no reason to fear nature. And this fundamental divide that we have of separation from that is where all this shit stems from. We're going to outsmart it. We're going to fucking have a pill for every disease. We're going to figure out a better food supply that can feed the masses instead of figuring out how to heal the soil and feed people locally and clean up water supplies like our buddy Justin Wren is doing with the pygmies. Bringing things back to nature in concert with it is the way forward. And it was the past. We have to circle back to that. And the further we get into outsmarting the thing that we're inherently interconnected with and interdependent of, it's just going to fucking lead us further and further away from the mission. Yeah. And there are people in charge with high fucking bankrolls that want that. And I think that's, that's been an experience. At the same time, with where I'm at now, I can, I can surrender to knowing this is a force that is potentially going to drive us to reconnect to nature. That, that from a bird's eye view, this may be the thing that gets enough people to say, let's live in community. Let's fucking heal the soil. Let's grow our own food. Let's, let's start to reconnect and do whatever we can in our part. Even if you live in a fucking apartment, like taking a 45 minute drive out of town to connect to a local rancher that does regenerative agriculture. You know, going to a farmer's market and spending five bucks more instead of fucking that Whole Foods. Like, little things like that can be your entry point and your give, you know. And, and Eisenstein talks about that. There's no, no effort is too small. No effort, no matter how little, when done for the good of all, goes unnoticed. Everything, no matter, every act, no matter how small, is felt through the all of consciousness. Well, that's the thing I was, uh, I think that sometimes the act of, like, living back to the, the death conversation, me or deathbed and be like, oh man, I didn't live my best life. Like, I think that we have access to begin being our, our highest self-actualized selves, you know, to lose, use Maslow talk in an instant, you know, and it doesn't need to be this grandiose, heroic, daunting task of I need to climb my metaphoric Mount Everest. And then it's like, like just in starting the process now, that's, that's enough. You know, so when you, when you have the mountain out there, you're like, oh my God, it's so much. I got, I got to get a backpack and I got to get a map. I got to get, a... it's like, no, you, you deciding to get the backpack and the map, that's, you're climbing the mountain. Yeah. You're in. Yeah. One step you could die time, now, right? you could die at the top. Like you're in, mm -hmm. you know, but I think oftentimes it's, it's easy in my mind to become, to feel like it's what I desire to feel complete in this life is, is too grandiose, which I think is just a bunch of illusion. You know, I think that, I think that it's all here right now. It is. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah. Matias Stefano. I talk about him on my podcast, but an excellent series. 
at least season one for sure on Gaia is called Initiation with Matthias De Stefano. And he, ta- he goes through, you know, episode one is unity. He goes through the dimensions, unity, duality, trinity, four pillars of consciousness, fifth dimension, sixth dimension, seventh, eighth is Akashic, nine is the return home. And uh, whatever you want to call that. In the seventh dimension, we got our seven power chakras. However, may have now, you know, it's up for grabs depending on which yeah. school you're in. Yeah. But with those seven, we should start a chakra system. <laughs> that would be fucking cool. Wouldn't that be dope? But the seven gave us the ability, <laughs> right here in our meat suit, to experience all levels, all dimensions of consciousness in our fucking human form. So the idea of ascension, I was talking with Claire about this this morning, the idea of ascension that we would leave here, like, uh, you know, the old Christian adage, and this is poo-pooing on Christianity, but like, I'll be a good boy here so I get to go to heaven. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, it's I'll be happy when, I'll work this job, then I retire, then I get to go to Costa Rica. Whatever the fucking lie is, that's Maya. That's the illusion. And the gift is that we, with these seven chakras, can experience every realm right here in this meat suit. And having lived in hell for a month in my waking state, and that was mirrored back to me through my interactions with Bear, with the dogs, with everything. Bear's your son. Yeah, with, with all of those things. Like, I know that's a lived experience. I know that's a felt experience by, by nodes of consciousness on this planet right now. And at the same time, having the gift of re- receiving my mind back after it was taken away, like I, I now can really appreciate the fact that we choose to live heaven on earth through action, through being, through our own knowing and our own resonance. And it's not something far away from us. It's not after Kyle Kingsbury or after Aaron Alexander. It's right now. Yeah. If we choose it, right? Yeah. I think the body is a, and this again isn't new information, but the body is an antenna. And so when you have a, if your antenna is kind of misaligned and contorted and torqued and twisted, it's not going to channel or access the same frequencies that one that was more robust. Robust. Yeah. yeah about buddy. that robusticity. <laughs> the robusticity. The robusticity. <laughs> so I have a, I have, I have a feeling that the, the ultimate grander point of taking care of the body and working to find balance and equipoise and, you know, all of those, all those words, alignment, is to, if you want to look at it from more spiritual lens, would to be relieve the corporeal situation of the static that is all the flares saying, tend to this, tend to this, tend to this. There's, there's fires here. Mm-hmm. You know, so if you have all of these fires that could, you know, quite literally be like inflammation in various different joints or maybe your brain or, you know, if you can find balance and ease within those, quell those, then all of a sudden it, it opens the antenna up for, to travel up that most Maslow's hierarchy mm. into higher states. Yeah. But it's like, I think it's like you have to take care and then maybe there could be a caveat to this because maybe the fires could be so bad that, you, that you're forced to transcend the body in a different way. And that yeah. is the teacher and that is the lesson. Yeah. But it's, the, I think, the liminal gray space where the body's just kind of shitty. You know, and it's like, it's like, it's this dull, ongoing, nagging kind of discomfort yeah. in self that that's the most challenging. It's like a drug addict. If someone's hooked on meth, it's almost a gift compared to someone that's, you know, hooked on power, mm-hmm. you know, or hooked on money or hooked on, you know, vanity or all the things because culture's like, oh yeah, you're awesome. More power. It's like, oh, God. okay, good. I'll, I'll do anything for it. All. You're like, yeah, yeah, it's great. You're, you're the cover of Entrepreneur. Well done. <laughs> both look like Smeagol on the inside though. Yeah, exactly. But they both look like Smeagol on the inside. Yeah. But I think it's, I think it's the, yeah, it's that, that gray, dull, aching static that's, it's almost, I'd rather be pushed to one pole or the other mm-hmm. just in order to create change. Yeah, then you could at least see it, right? Yeah. Circling back to awareness. With the awareness, that's the first step in being able to track. Yeah. I, I got a question for you. Yeah. Um, what has been, you know, we, we had this journey last night with East Forest and uh, I don't know if you got to journal about it, but I wanted to hear how your experience was because if you're willing to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because it, it's... Uh, for me, it was so alchemizing in my experience from what I've previously spoken to, and maybe I'll dive into it, but I, I want to know what your experience was like because you, you know, for a container, you know, we're outdoors in Costa Rica and the wind's there, the trees are there. East Forest is, he's been on my podcast twice. He's fucking 
really special, mm -hmm. really special, especially for holding space and providing, you know, music as medicine. But, yeah. but in the pairing, you know, of an altered state, um, really, you know, one of the few that is uh, able to carry that medicine. So yeah. I was wondering how your experience was. There are so many different things. Um, the one I did journal about it this morning, I realized how much I sound like a fruity new agey guy. <laughs> I'm like, come on, man. I'm journaling. We're talking about femininity and spirituality. I feel like we need to like swing some kettlebells and like sit. Just to balance we should it wrestle. Should we yeah, wrestle we on the wrestle. podcast? Yeah, we can do that. We'll get somebody else to just come handy cam style. It's a rocky beach, but yeah. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> um, so there was a bunch of different things. The one thing that was that was a really powerful visceral sensation was this year I've been more interested and open and engaged with relationships with a, a feminine counterpart than I've been for probably 10 years, mostly out of just, I think, uh, unreadiness, fear, you know, I'm just really not feeling ready in myself because I felt like I had so much more work to do before I could really bring in the partner that matched what I desired, which could be a story, but I felt like that was the case for essentially like the last decade. I was kind of like not really available to be in a relationship. And presently, I, I feel like I'm more available than I've ever been in a more mature way. Uh, and that was a sensation that I was experiencing last night was for me, the sensation of being able to, this is going to sound, here we go, uh, like rest into my feminine. And again, feminine, masculine, that's just, you know, oh, kind of like a, a tool to express something maybe that's a little more ineffable. But to rest into that listening, that nurturing, that creativity, that exhalation, that oh, I don't need to support or contain or defend or think or problem solve or plan. It's just, oh, oh. You know, so that would be, I think, feminine. Yeah. You know, you could yeah. define it however you'd you were, like. You it's were just a, held. A, Held, yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely So, so all, the, all these words, they're just didactic tools to try to express something that's... Language in general. Language is, in general, yeah. yeah. So when I say masculine, feminine, it probably at least 25% of people probably rolling their eyes. 75% of people are like, oh, this is great. No, I think they but get it's... enough of that on this on my podcast for sure. We, oddly enough, you know, no I would hope that some people do roll their eyes because I think a lot of people that do lead with that kind of new age type conversation, it's a bit of a guise to, to well, protect something, some kind of insecurity or power, is, power, reaching for power or whatever it might be. I've had a conversation with Godzi recently about this new lexicon of spirituality where people in relationships basically use a different tool set of language to, to get say laid. the fucking same thing, that, you know, either to get laid yeah. or to pass blame on another in relationship, like, oh, you're gaslighting. Right. And uh, that's a projection. You're projecting on, you know. It's just another it, mask. Man. Yeah. Spirituality is just another mask. There's a deeper spirit that's, it's the... Ever present. <sighs> yeah. There's no way it's just... Oh. You know, and then there's all the jargon and the talk and yeah. it's the same as everything else. But within everything else, there's a pure form and then there's the... 80, 90, whatever percent of this the less is, pure. This is getting into the Lucifer and Aramon, which oh I can circle back to uh, <laughs> big time. Not not the other conversation we we're going to have. I've, I've talked with Shervin on this podcast about it. Um, I don't find anything wrong with the language you used to describe the feminine. What I was pointing out is that this week for Fit for Service is all on the sacred feminine. Mm. So that there's no coincidence there. Next trimester, sacred masculine. Final trimester of the year, divine union. So... I sat with a similar feeling in that. And your man arm, your dude arm on top of mine was my grounding cord that really allowed me to release into that and not need to try or figure shit out. It was just like right. there was a human element in you laying next to me and Resvani on my left that allowed me to fully let go. Yeah. You know? And that, that was really fucking special for me. Yeah, so that was the thing that I was experiencing. That was just like, I think in order to... So I do like acro yoga. You know, I pick people up and twist them around. And there's sometimes do more acrobatic stuff, sometimes therapeutic stuff. But something that's very well informing with, I think, anything, but in acro for this specific example, is to, if you were a base, that's the person that's on the ground, spinning people around, you learn so much from flying. 
flying as the person that's up top and gets twisted and turned and is like a beautiful butterfly. You've flown me many times. Yeah, exactly. I'm your butterfly. Yeah, exactly. You're my butterfly. Exactly. <laughs> um, but within that, it's such a beautiful thing because when you are being flown, if you're typically the base, 98% of the time you're the base, when you're flown, you learn so much about how to base better. Mm. And that was the really interesting sensation last night. I was essentially, most of my life, I think I, I lean into um, more like masculine qualities, even though I'm, I'm very, I think, ambi with that. But last night, it was this interesting sensation of like, this is it. This is what the feminine desires at a, a, a deep core level. This sensation of, oh, wow, like the music is, I mean, the music's just like, it's, it's nurturing. The sound is good. It feels safe. There's no glitching. There's no, it's like, oh, wow, it's, it's been taken care of. It's tended to. It's just like well thought out. <laughs> yeah, you not know? their first rodeo. Yeah, exactly. Like the ground is like, it's like we got mats. It's like soft. There's like this breeze coming through. I have the support of my community. And I feel just so held and so safe. And within that, that held safety, it allows me, you know, whatever, whatever me, consciousness, self, whatever, um, to start to drift and wander and expand and and just like rest into something that's not survival go. Yeah. You know, and that was an interesting sensation. I was like, oh, like, I mean, this is what women want. You know, not in a sleazy, slimy, like, okay, here's how I'm going to, here's the tips to get laid. But I'm like, this is what women want. Yeah. Or feminine want. This is what men yeah. want too. The feminine aspect of men and women. Uh, we have both poles. Yeah. Everyone does. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. But that so that was just a very interesting sensation that I found to be kind of novel in a way where I was like, it felt like full on like a uh, like school. I was like, oh wow, like this is this is cool. Okay, how do I maintain that that the lessons that I'm getting from the periphery from my environmental conditions here? How do I embody that? Pull that in into my next conversation you know, or into my next engagement of any sort. Like that sensation that I was able to feel through not any one specific person, it was an aggregate of, you know, a hundred different people. But how do I, I, I bottle and encapsulate that sensation in order to be able to, you know, carry it in my life? Yeah, I think there is, a, I get what you're saying with that terminology. And at the same time, I want to say that there, there's no holding on to any of it. That's part of the the experience is to experience it in the now. And then when you need the refresh, that's the beauty of having another experience like that, mm. you know, and at the same time, how you carry that in between is that not making it a requirement for that experience again, you know, to be the person that goes back to the wishing well, my hands raised right now more often than necessary, Yeah, you know, and uh, yeah, the masculine, even, even like the self, when you were talking about our bodies as an antenna or a tuning fork, Samantha Sweetwater told, talked to me about this. She's a, incredible woman studied under Dr. Will Tegel and many others, homies with Charles Eisenstein and just a brilliant, brilliant medicine woman. And she talked about, you know, our bodies are our own inner earth, how we tend our own garden, not only influences how we think and feel, but that, that is a reflection of what we give to the earth. Yeah. You know, it's not just, Oh yeah, I recycle or I do this. Like, no, I me tending my own garden of my body is that's, that's putting your ante in yeah. to the game. And right? you, you know, you are the earth. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so, yeah, fuck yeah. <laughs> you're yeah. Like, so, so you're for fully your, the earth. So how you walk with that feminine in that safety net, and this is medicine for me too, is allowing the masculine to hold that. You know, it's allowing the mountain energy, your own inner mountain of the masculine to hold your feminine. And if it's there authentically and not, you know, in a make-believe sense, because the inner knowing knows where you're fucking full of shit or not, right? Oh, yeah. But if you're if you're standing in that and likely from grounding practices, opening the body, having that channel fucking wide open, not twisted and contorted, in that experience, the body likely does feel safe enough to express itself, to listen, to surrender to not knowing outcome. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. Want to take a quick moment to have a word from our cherished sponsors, Bio Optimizers. If you've ever said, 
you're going to go with your gut. It's not just a saying, your gut really is connected to your brain and signals pass back and forth between them. Unfortunately, 74% of Americans are suffering from digestive problems like gas, bloating, and abdominal pain. This is a sign that your microbiome is out of balance and that your gut-brain connection isn't working the way it should. This is bad news because gut problems also affect your mood and happiness. How is this possible? Well, 90% of your serotonin is created in your gut, and serotonin plays a big part in how you feel. If your gut is out of balance, it could disrupt the normal production and cycling of serotonin, and you won't feel as happy and positive as you normally do. There is a good news there is good news though. If you rebalance your gut, you'll start to feel better physically and emotionally and your gut brain connection will be restored. Even better, this doesn't have to be a long drawn out process. You can change your gut microbiome and start feeling better in as little as 72 hours. Here's how you do it. My friends at Bioptimizers have developed an exciting new formula that combines cutting edge nutrition that you would normally find in two separate products. This breakthrough formula combines powerful probiotics and prebiotics to restore the balance in your gut, plus 17 nootropics and adaptogenic brain herbs to enhance mood and manage stress and improve your memory. It's all in one formula called Cogna Biotics, and it's a perfect solution for supporting your gut health, brain health, mental health, all at the same time. And... Here's the best part. Cognitive Biotics comes with one full year guarantee. So I encourage you to try it risk-free and see for yourself how much better you feel. If you would like to get yourself 10% off of Cognitive Biotics, you can go to cognibiotics.com slash line. That's C-O-G-N-I-B-I-O-T-I-C-S dot com slash align. You use align 10 to receive 10% off of your order. Again, that's cognibiotics.com slash align. Yeah, the body's two things. One, I like to add more solidity and grounding to big new agey statements like you are the earth. There's a metaphor <laughs> metaphor from Watts that I really love that I'm, I'm sure you're, you've already heard a bunch of times, but he talks about apple trees. You know, an apple tree's appling. So you go buy an apple tree and you see the apple coming out and it's hanging off this thread there. And you're like, wow, what a great apple. It's like that apple is the tree. You know, it's a continuation of the tree. And so he talks about the earth peopling. Mm. Have you heard this before? No. Oh, it's great. This is it's dope. Just, this is a, yeah, it's a great just uh, like metaphor or analogy in my mind to see that, you know, at some point that we're, if you believe in evolution, uh, but at some point the earth was a you know bunch of rocks and for that, you know, maybe, you know, a bunch of stardust, whatever. And then eventually, just like the tree, you know, the tree starts off, germinate this little seed, grows up, it's just leaves and sticks. And then eventually, there's oh, apple. You know, so the, the earth is, is similar in that way, where it's started off as a bunch of rocks. And then all of a sudden, with time and evolution and germination and all the things, all of a sudden, bah, here we are. But I think it's easy to, to buy the idea that, you know, I'm separate. And that more Watt stuff, he says, he says, we're taught that we come into this world. And mm. so that from the drop, that belief that I came into this world, it's like, okay, there's a separation. Yeah. There's me, there's the world, I'm, I'm entering. Yeah. It's like, no, you, you are the world. You're directly an outcropping of the world. And so the way that you treat yourself isn't just a kind of like a, a proxy or a metaphor, or, you know, as below, or so, how's, how's it go? As above, so below. Mm -hmm. It's like above and below are the same shit. Yeah. It's just a continuation. Yeah. Anyways, so that was so. So you are the Earth. I was like, oh God, I'm doing it again. I love that. No, brother, that's 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 good shit. <laughs> Hold on, but then I have a okay. thing. Give me more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so the the body, a grounded way to to perceive that that you know those those contractions and such that might have existed in our body for you know, since we were babies. You know, we we learned that at some point it wasn't safe to be at our, you know, with our family and our home and, you know, in, in, in the world. Um, that is like, kind of like, again, more of a nebulous, like, oh, interesting. But when you think of like fear, like anybody can, you can portray fear in your body right now. You can't be afraid without physically expressing fear. And so if you're afraid, you, you know, you'll, you'll contract your, your traps will engage and your scalenes and your masseter, maybe your fists and, you know, blood will perfuse into the, periphery into your, you know, into your legs, into your arms to like run you out of the room. 
your pupils will physically dilate. You're taking in more light, more information. You go in this fight, flight, get the freak out of the room. You know, and so when we say there's there's trauma in the body, it's like, no, there's it working in real time. You're perceiving trillions of bits of information that's informing the structure and posture and physiology and chemistry and hormones and everything of this physical vehicle. You know, and so just thinking of what's my postural expression of feeling safe, feeling held, feeling supported, feeling a part of something bigger than myself, feeling like I can oh, drop the weight. You know, there's no just, there's no me. You know, I'm a part of something much larger. You know, how does that feel? Or how does it feel to be alone, to feel afraid, to feel, you know, any of those things? Like, how does that posturally express? So that in an instant, your body will change based off of your emotion. So what happens when the body gets stuck in those, those patterns and you never, you know, close the container like you're talking about before? You shook the pattern off eventually the pattern, it becomes like a, like, a, like a valley of sorts, you know, like a rut. You get stuck in those different patterns. And then it's like, who's, you're almost expressing mentally, emotionally, the past held memory of those physical contractions. Because yeah. when you form, contort yourself into that defensive position, you start to perceive the world more like, oh, they're out to get me. Yeah. So you're holding on to your cell phone all day, forward head posture on the computer, hunching over the desk. So your spine's rolling forward. It's affecting the way that you breathe. Your breath's more up in that sympathetic fight flight type place. And then it informs the way you perceive the world. And then that feeds back. And it becomes this real stuck pattern that it becomes who we think we are. But that's just this very small topical tip of the iceberg layer that we've kind of attached on to. But it feels safe because it's all that we know. But then to have a pattern interrupt like last night's experience, like a, like a big like, kind of pause on all of that, it's such an interesting thing to have. That. I know I'm just rambling on, but it's such an interesting thing to have the opportunity to feel safe, held all of those things enough to be able to draw the lens back and see that, oh, that contracted layer that we all carry. I'm contracted, you're contracted, you're also love and light and rainbows and all that stuff. But there's also the contraction, the twists and the turns that most of us stick on. Um, wow, that was just a, a small fragment of this human experience that I've been running as my full OS operating mm-hmm. system for the last, you know, different time frame for different people. Anyways, thanks for letting me ramble on. That was dope. Hopefully bro. some of no, that had some I'm, semblance I'm of sense. Too. It's, something, <laughs> it's, it's curious. Like when, when quarantine started, I, my back went out. First time in my life. And, uh, you know, the as above, so below, whatever you want to call that. Principle of correspondence. Sorry, I got my feet all in your business. Dog, um, we're but, about to snuggle out here. <laughs> scissor me timbers. <laughs> scissor me timbers. We, uh, what does cuck mean? Is that when your wife gets... A cuck. Yeah, that's I've when been you called that before. That's, that's when, when you. That's when a guy whimpers in the corner while some dude with a bigger cock bangs his wife. That's exactly. Just making sure. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> continue. Oh my God, we got. We needed comedic relief. <laughs> there you have it. Back to the spiritual conversation. I'm just trying to learn. Yeah. I'm just trying to learn. Yeah. Uh, so, so my body went out with quarantine starting, and what's funny is like this is the first time I've done rehab or PT since fighting and. Probably more so when I was playing football where we had, you know, PTs on staff in the weight room or in the, in the PT room. And I'd, I'd go in for the training room every day to get work on. And I didn't even start. You know, I didn't play much at ASU. But I still utilize the trainers all the time. Not just for body work and things like that, but to fix imbalances. And one thing that's been funny to me is people notice, like you know this because you're, you're a cuck, a body worker. <laughs> You're a cuck. We know this. You're From one cuck, cuck you know to about, another. You know about this stuff. <laughs> one cuck to another. Let's be real. Um, my left trap sits higher than my right. My left shoulder sits higher than my right. My right rector spinae, you know, that big fucking back strap, is probably twice the size of my left. My right glute doesn't fire. My right foot sits at a duck angle 45 degrees compared to my left foot straight. Hip mobility is all, everything is, uh, is it asymmetrical? Yeah. Whereas, yeah, it's one-sided, right? One-sided, yeah. Well, as it turns out, that, if I'm just standing, is my fight stance. Mm-hmm. So, so for eight years or 10 years, I was in this stance. And <laughs> due to the realness of fucking getting hit in the face, my body 
started to map that as a stance of security. Right. And my muscle started to change because of that. And it's actually held that pattern to this day, even though I haven't fought in eight years or seven years, at least not full time. I've had a couple one offs with our boy Jason Ellis, but nothing consistent. No, not even striking consistently. Yet I'm in my fight stance. And I don't stand, you know, like fucking Saget in, in Street Fighter 2. I'm just, that's my <laughs> patterning, right? And so I'm finally getting that worked on and fixing imbalances. For the, I mean, there's no reason for this. When I was at, I remember welcoming Exos into on it and helping with them design supplements and do different things with them. And I never utilized them. And now I'm like, why did I fucking wait this long? But all that to say, in working with them and fixing imbalances, like there, it has a different feel to the waking state, yeah. to the embodied cognition. Well, feeling home in your body. Mm -hmm. Who feels home in their body? Do you feel home in your body? I do now. For a long time, I didn't. That's where the alcohol and cocaine came in. How yeah. often do you feel home in your body? This is an interesting question to ask. And again, a, more of a, maybe a cut question to ask, but... but cut questions. <laughs> cut questions. <laughs> Kyle Kingsbury. That's the next solo cast. <laughs> Taking all cut questions. We do get... That, that always comes up on a, on a Q&A for my wife and I. There's at least one or two cut questions. <laughs> but that's like real... That's real shit. Like, like, imagine living in a house. And I, I write about this, I think, same analogy in my, my book. Have it like going into a house and not feeling home there. Like it's you're a guest in somebody else's house. Okay, make sure everything's organized because you don't want to, oh, don't leave the spoon there. Home. It's, it's almost like you have to like tiptoe around the house, which is a thing. Some kids literally tiptoe around their, their place. You know, have you ever seen that before? Bear does or I'll beat him. He what? No. He, oh, good, good, good. no, but that's a real, there's a mix. Yeah. It's a real thing. It's like a stage people go through. It's probably got a name, like tiptoeing. Huh. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think, you know, think of it which, what you wish, but I would think there's something to that of just not really feeling like safe, secure, grounded, comfortable, you know, not having that masculine sensation of, of support. But so drawing out that metaphor of that sensation that you feel when you're not at home, where ideally would be like your home base, your anchor of support. How does that feel in your body? Well, it feels a little bit contracted. You know, you just can't oh, like, oh, just rest. Throw your pants off and just fucking do whatever. Like, oh, here you're home. It's cool, man. Whatever you want to express, express it. You're good. You're home. You know, so having that sensation, it's like, wow, like what a beautiful thing. It opens up to creativity and it opens up to, you know, expansion and just feeling like more of yourself. So now draw that same sensation that a person would have in a physical brick and mortar home. How is that? in your physical body. You know, it's the sensation of feeling just always twisted and contorted and that static sensation or you know, maybe your mind just keeps on racing even though your, your body is completely drained. Mm. That's, that's not... Tired and wired. Tired and wired. Yeah. That's not a sensation of, oh, man, I'm home. You know, so to, to live a life like that, to me, it's just wild that how many, I mean, I, I experienced, I think with anything, it's like enlightenment. It's like a fleeting, you know, yeah, you cool. You were enlightened for 15 seconds, two weeks ago. Like, you know, and now we're, now we're back in the process of coming back. But I think at that home sensation in the body, to me, it's, it's worthwhile to invest in, in creating the, the spaciousness to feel home in the body, you know, and there's a lot of tools to get there. Absolutely. But the general idea is, my question to you is, do you feel home in your body? Yeah. I mean, not right this second per se due to this couch. I'm going to blame something other than myself. Um, it's probably not about the couch. Probably not. <laughs> it is digging into my back. But the, uh, <laughs> there is a visceral understanding in plant medicines that I've received multiple times, likely because I needed to hear it more than once. But wherever I'm at, I'm home. Wherever yeah. I'm at in the universe, I'm home. Yeah. You know? to really feel into that is a special feeling, you mm -hmm. know? And, and here in Costa Rica, without my family, who I miss dearly, I feel fucking home, you know? I do feel home by the beach, by the Pacific. I'll always have, like, a, all the shit I talk about California, it's always going to be my home, you know? Yeah. But, but coming out here first thing this morning, up at six, because I'm still quantumly entangled with bear, <laughs> no matter what, when the sun comes up, I just went skinny dipping in the pool, well, we're in a house with a lot of women and other people, and I know everybody, but yeah, I'm still like, 
oh, yeah, well, somebody walks out. And it's like, no, I'm fucking home. <laughs> yeah. I'm like getting there naked. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. People walk on the beach and, you know, see a, a big dude with a average to below average size <laughs> penis getting in the pool. That's, <laughs> that's part and parcel of their Costa Rica experience. <laughs> you know? Like, I'm, I'm home. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fucking, I'm going to embody that. I'm going to say yes to that. And there's, there's little acts <laughs> like that. That's the opposite of the OCD where does my spoon go? Yeah. Uh, I have to make my own bed, even though there's a maid here to make it. And yes, I know this sounds quite privileged. We have fucking maids here, but um, you know, the a lot of that's just the sensation acts. of being out of control, I think. Yes. Yeah. Wanting to hyper, yeah, wanting to control every aspect of the environment. Yeah. When you feel out of control, you'll try to micromanage all the little things. And it seems on the outside, again, it's 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 an illusion. It's very, it's like whatever you think, think the opposite. Yeah. You know, so when a person is so organized and they've rolled up all their shirts and they have everything delineated. This guy's dialed in. Wow, he's dialed in. He might be a wreck inside. Yeah. (laughs) Or not. He might just enjoy, you know, rolling up his stuff and keep it organized. That may, oddly enough, be their peace and harmony is in the act of doing that. That might be their meditation and action. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But but there there are choices we can make that are however small, like derobing every last article of clothing and getting in a pool and not, not okay. worrying about what other people think of that. You know? Like, can I not care what people think of my penis size? And even though I have a wife and never need to worry about that, like, can I, can I actually just discard any thought of what other would view me as? Yeah. In anything in life. Yeah. You know, it doesn't mean like fucking go through, like, go through life like a bull in a china shop. Of course, I want to be uh, cognizant of my environment, yeah. human or otherwise. But at the same time, like, can I just say, can I make a decision or a choice that brings me into more freedom, that brings me into more openness, that brings me into more allowing and surrender and just be like, yeah, let's do that and see how that feels. Yeah. You know, it was it was exceptional. So they, I have an invitation for people to skinny dip more often, but mm-hmm. it is exceptional. And it's it, it grants the permission for someone else to to relax. Yeah. You know, it's it's like we're always attuning to each other's rules about how to conduct ourselves. Mm-hmm. You know, more more Ramdas said I'll pretend to think you are who you think you are if you pretend to think I am who I think I <laughs> yeah, am. Yeah, he talks about that and cutting kill me nobody. Yeah. <laughs> it's and cold, that's, dude. That's, that's what we're doing. Cold. That is exactly that's what, what we're, we're doing. doing. You're like, okay, cool. You're Kyle, ex UFC, all the things. I'm Aaron Cuck, you know, I'm, below I'm, average. I'm a professor now. <laughs> they asked me right when I came to the country, what, you know, what's your job? And I'm a professor. And and what's great. Hello, Aubrey Marcus. Aubrey Marcus. Marcus. Look at them fucking short shorts. Wow. You got to step in front of the camera just for the wow. YouTubers. Come on, buddy. He's throwing <laughs> kicks again. Oh, look out for that high kick. Get them kicks in. Powerful Come on, you got you to bring it in here. Powerful, you got you to get in here. Powerful those windmill. Are, those wow. are fucking great shorts, son. Damn. Little, little cameo. Nice. Um, Aubrey ain't no cuck. Those kicks <laughs> totally threw me off. That was shorts <laughs> like that. <laughs> If there was one man called Cuck more than me, I'm looking at him. <laughs> yep. Yep. I got to give credit. Credit to the champion. Uh, where were we? I don't know. We weren't on Cucks. We were, defi- we were defining uh, safety in the bottom. No, it was Ramdas. Ram Let's check this. Yeah. Ramdas. I'll pretend you are who you think you are if you pretend I. Oh, yeah. Giving people the allowance to, to, to rest into being themselves. So by you being willing to be open to the judgment, while also, I think, respecting the rules of, of culture, but mm-hmm. pushing, respectfully pushing the boundaries, I think is really important. Because if you don't respectfully push the boundaries, the boundaries will eventually suffocate you. So I think there's this natural, it's like the, the, you know, the, the tongue naturally acts as a retainer to, to push open the upper palate. You know, and keep spaciousness in the mouth. That's one of the reasons that nose breathing is really valuable, especially as a young person, but always. There's also like, you know, nitric oxide and structural, well, that is the structural conversation. Um, but that tongue acts as a, as a retainer because there's continually this, this inward force coming in. And so if you don't have that retainer continually pushing out, creating that equilibrium and balance, then the face collapses in on itself. Polarity in the mouth hole. Polarity in the mouth hole. Yeah. I'm all about orifice polarity. Yeah. Yeah. We should do a whole podcast on that. The... But hold on. So it's, it's, it's stepping into 
okay, what's the, the, the cultural boundaries that this, you know, the zeitgeist, the, the, the collective is, has, has all agreed upon and say, okay, cool. I, I feel that. You know, it's the boundary of the face. And then from here, okay, how do I lean into that just enough, but not too much to like blow out the chin? Because I, I don't need to be too aggressive with it. You know, but in situations like that, it's like we're in a pretty open place. So like, you know, taking off your, your undies and going for a swim is, is it's leaning, but it's not like blowing it out of the water where we're like, oh my God, it has the, the, the reverse effect. And so it gives other people around the opportunity to say, oh, wow, like I can do my version of that. And then I think the more that we start living in that way, the, the, you know, the, the freer we all feel. And then ultimately what that leads to the, the collective body is to be able to start to relax and ease and drop the, the, the chronic contraction that eventually leads to disease. Because if you dam, you know, the dam, that blockage is what eventually leads to, to, to build up and toxicity and, and disease of whatever form. And so if you're chronically living in a state of contraction, then you're presenting the opportunity for discomfort, toxicity to build up. And so you don't need to be a physical therapist or a massage therapist or a naturopathic doctor or something to be in the support of cultural health and well-being. You just living a more free lifestyle without smashing the boundaries. You just leaning against the boundaries respectfully, but enough to create change and open invitation for other people to relax into themselves. You're literally a doctor. Doctor means teacher. You're literally, you're like providing medicine to the collective in that. Mm. Yeah, I feel medicine when I see people with their masks off. Just in that conversation of permission. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's a rabbit hole in and of itself. We don't need to hash. It's been hashed a hundred times, at least on my podcast. But um, I don't mind the mask. I know that's going to probably... People no, are going to be like, does, oh, it, it does, I, I, and, Something I've told people from the jump before this really got <laughs> wacky was the fact that if people are in a state of fear, I'm not going to teach some guy at a grocery store there's nothing to be afraid of. Yeah. If it puts him into a greater state of fear, likely that will not likely, that will cause an immune response within them yeah. if they're living in fear that I don't need to add to. Oh. And I'm not going to change that guy's mind by like, hey, you listen to the podcast Dr. Rashid Batar did on London Real or listen to fucking Dale Bigtree on my podcast or listen to The Highway or listen to X, Y, and Z, Zach Bush, like whatever the fucking, there, there's a plethora of information. It's so impossible to parse out truth right now. Though. But I'm not, but I'm not going to, but, but what resonates? What do you mean? It's, it's truth in, exists, truth does but it's exist. very, very challenging to parse out what really is true because my, my mind on what truth is today historically has shifted, you know, tomorrow, a week, a month, like things that I really held on to be true. Historically, I've been like, oh, I was, I was, I was not correct on that. My intuition was off on that. I was all in. I pushed the chips on this thing and I was incorrect. And so with this, I'm, you know, I'm leaning into, in my own truth, I agree with, with what you're saying for myself and for the people around me. But for the collective truth, I feel like I just, I don't know enough about the conversation to inform other people with my belligerent ideas. Yeah. You know what I mean? I feel confident in what I'm saying, and I don't mean that egoically. I mean that from the people that I've had conversations with and the knowing I've received from nature itself. Yeah. And I can stand behind that. I can also stand behind the fact that, <laughs> mark my words, I'm not dying from a fucking virus, plain and simple. I'm not going out like that when I'm 80. Yeah. I'm not going out like that now. I'm not going to die of diabetes. I'm not going to die of obesity. I'm not going to die of Alzheimer's. You're not can, even, you're can, not even. I'm, I'm, I'll say it now and speak it into existence. That's not the way I fucking go out. Why do we knock on wood? I don't know. What is that? I don't know. Why would that? Did I say knock on wood? No. Okay. I'm just thinking in yeah, my yeah, mind, yeah, I'm like, yeah. oh, knock on wood. Yeah. No, I don't need to knock on wood for that. You know, I really don't. I really don't. And I've, and I've thrown that out there, you know. In the past, there is no knock on wood with that. I know it. And that's not a false sense of security, you know. But that's some, that's my experience. It's not everyone's experience. I understand that. At the same time, I would rather live and die on my feet than, than live longer to a later age on my knees. Yeah. You know, and that's, 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 that's. That there's a one lens in which we can view the world right now. I think what I'm what I'm learning in the whole thing is that more Ram Dass. My reaction to other people's reaction is 
it's none of their business. Like I, I'm like they, he he describes people as just trees. If you'd walk through a forest and a tree grows in a funny way or you know whatever, you're like, look at this. Oh my up god! Tree. Oh, I can't believe it. That's not how a tree grows. Yeah. Like, oh, it kills me. Yeah. Oh, this poor bastard. He didn't get enough sunlight. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. You're just like, oh yeah, cool. Like whatever, cool. A tree. You know, and you can appreciate the beauty of it because you don't personify and identify with. Oh, that's going against creating friction of of my my belief structures. You know, you see a tree, it's all misshapen, strange, whatever it is. You're just like, wow, cool. It's like art. Yeah. You know, and so that's been my experience just to, I think, create a little bit of um, ease throughout the, all of like so the, me, all, the, me, all the, the let politics. Me play, that, allow me to play devil's advocate. You do a good job of this for me. So yeah. I'm going to do this for you. Yeah. Imagine if you walked through a forest and a tree told you you needed to change your posture. Yeah. And then they made it law that you change your posture to hunch over and, and tree differently. Well, so that, that would be when it becomes more problematic. And that's so that's, what we're, that's, but, that's exactly what we're looking at. But what at, I'm saying with the, mass, with the mask thing specifically is it doesn't bother me in the slightest if the whole world wears masks for the rest of their lives, if that's what they really desire and makes them feel good and whole and safe because they're just a bunch of trees. But once the trees start telling me that I need to do a thing because Correct. they know my body better than my body, that's where I do step in. Correct. And that, so, and this is great because this is a conversation on sovereignty. Yeah. Um, and oddly enough, the mask conversation is the vaccine conversation. It's the travel passport conversation. It's, it's, it's all interwoven. And what we acquiesce to now determines potentially what we acquiesce to later. And, and, you know, say what you want about David Icke. You know, one of the things he said, you look to the East if you want to see the future of the West. I don't know if we end up in a social credit system, but flying here to Costa Rica, facial recognition is already in the airports. Yeah. Uh, passports will change. You go through TSA and it says coming up in this year, we're going to require updated uh, smart driver's license or passports. Well, nobody's getting implanted with the chip yet, but your fucking ID sure as hell are going to have chips. All of these things are being put into place. It's not, it's not um, 30 years from now. We're right here. You know, and that's, that's the thing to be conscientious of and at least have a, as a part of the conversation because at this point of the game, there are trees saying you need to tree differently. Mm -hmm. and, and if we are to remain sovereign and to live and let live and to give each other... You know, David E. Martin was back on the podcast on my last episode, and he talked about um, one of the oldest laws from the Persian Empire included tolerance. And Thomas Jefferson, who was sworn in on the Koran, who helped write the Constitution of the United States, included a piece of that because it was that good from an ancient culture. We need to take a piece of this. Mm -hmm. But tolerance didn't mean... Like, yeah, I'll put up with this person and their beliefs. Like, all right, fine, you want to do this, you want to do that, I'll, I'll tolerate it. Tolerance in their culture meant to know their language, eat their food, know their culture, know their dance, their dance, know everything about them. And that was tolerance. It went beyond putting up with someone or saying, yeah, it's not how I want to live. But I mean, it didn't mean becoming them. That's different. You still hold your own, but at the same point, it meant a deeper level of granting access to sovereignty for other people that went beyond freedom of religion. And we are seeing that being taken away right now. And it's worth mentioning again and again and again until people fucking understand, like, <laughs> there are freedoms being taken away that may not come back. You know, Patriot Act goes in, doesn't get taken away. Like when people get wise and they're like, ah, WMDs weren't there and this is, you know, X, Y, and Z didn't happen and who knows what fucking, what was the cause of 9-11. That's here to stay, you know? So what we say yes to now, that may be the new norm that 30 years from now we say, why the fuck did we say yes to that? Sure. So it's just something to be mindful of, you know, really, because <laughs> I'm going down swinging before I have somebody put an injection in me. Or my kids, for that matter, especially my kids. I'm going out swinging before somebody makes it a rule where my kid gets to choose its sex at five years old. I can stand by that confidently. Yeah. I wonder, for, for me, I think it's like the... It's kind of hard for me personally to know at what point I, I do 
draw a line in the sand and and speak up and step up and you know feel impassioned about a topic. And at what point do I um, have kids, Aaron? Yeah, maybe that's maybe that's the thing. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's it. Thousand percent. Right. So how has having kids affected you in relation to, the, to these conversations? Because it's not just me yeah. that I think about in every aspect. You know, it's uh, it's really easy to, you know, especially when we get in the airy-fairy language, new age, spirituality, whatever, to be like, you know, t- what kind of world will we leave behind seven generations from now? What, 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 will, what will the upcoming generations inherit? from what we leave for them. Not like a, this was my bank account. I left my kids or any of that kind of shit. But like, how many trees are there going to be? How many, uh, look, there's a lot of trees. I'm not saying there isn't, but which animals will be here? What kind of fish will be in the ocean? Yeah. All of those things are kind of abstract, but it's it gets really granular when you have kids because it's not a off in the distance question. It's not a down the road. You know, you don't get to kick it down the road. You get to see what's happening right now and forget any of the potentials of what the future holds. Look no further than what's happening right now in public schools. You know, think about that. Think about having to check in. Think about medicalizing school. Think about getting your fucking face zapped with some kind of temperature thing. Oh, yeah, there's no... What are you going to say? There's EMFs in a temperature gauge. Like, I'm not saying that. But just think of what becomes routine standard, like livestock getting fucking shipped in for your school experience. And, and you understand this better than anyone, perhaps, about facial recognition and body language. What it would be like to spend your entire upbringing where you're a fucking sponge, not being able to see someone's face. Yeah. That's right now. That's not 10 months from now, 10 years from now. That's right now. And it's not my son's experience. And there is privilege in that because I live in Texas and because I'm connected to the people I'm connected to and because he's never been in a school that required masks and he fucking never will. I'm going to make sure of that. That's not the vast majority of the people on this planet's experience. And I think a part of this conversation is to illuminate like you can, through your understanding of what's important, what's really important to you for your kids, to cultivate that with community. Yeah. And no one's going to solve it for you. There's no fucking, you know, daddy in the sky, as Paul Check calls it, all the way down to government. There's no one that's going to do it for you. You got to find your tribe and do it together. I think with, with things like that, it's it, for me, like a lot of things, it's, it's hard to know a part of not digging one's feet in the ground and saying, this is where I stand is not, it's easier just to go with the flow. And it's hard to find footing if your intuition goes against that, especially when you don't have like-minded community around you. You know, in my opinion, in all of like the politicized things happening now, I'm kind of like, again, I don't, I don't think my opinion carries enough weight for me to express it in this, in this conversation. But that is an interesting thing in, in general, is finding a footing where there is no real ground. You know, it's like where, like, if you do feel those those ways, how does a person even start to it's, make it's a change? Comes, it comes back to know thyself. You know, like, what is worth it for me? What is worth it for my family? What is it for my community? Am I living in the right place? You know, I, I've spoken about this many times that that for whatever reason, how it's panned out politically, and you know, from the coast through the center of the country, or you know, just just uh, ideologically. There has been more of a push for these things from the left than the right. There has been more, um, and perhaps because of population density in New York and L.A., just a different vibe in those cities. And even within Texas, you look at Austin in comparison to the rest of the state or the major cities, which are now pretty liberal, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, Austin for sure the most much tighter restrictions than the rest of the state when it comes to this stuff. That's not me saying I'm a Republican now or I'm fucking standing with this team or or whatever identity thing that I want to do, go team red, whatever that is. It's uh, no, man, fucking, I don't know many 
I, I voted for Bernie Sanders in 2016, you know, and, yeah. and, and, and see through that now, but at, that was where I was at. And I, in the primary, we got a little lizard medicine behind us. Oh man. That's, that's pretty proper. It's out of, out of shot now. Oh, no. coming back up the tree. We got the unicorn floating in the pool. Here we go. Too. Check he's him out. He's coming back in. This is worth looking uh, at. Oh, that's a big old. Yeah, that's that's a pretty guy right there. Yeah, I was Poor terrified girl. of those guys um, just like three days ago. Now I realize you can pick them up by the tail, and they're actually quite uh, docile creatures. Pretty cool. Yeah. Um, what I was getting to is that like I I very much am liberal in many ways. I'm very much conservative in at least a few ways. I'm all the things. Yeah. I'm not just, oh, I'm centrist. No, I have some left views, some right views in between, like most people do. And I don't identify on a team one way or the other how it's played out or you could just look at it like a, a location standpoint there are some differences between the coasts and the other parts of the country and you may find that it's necessary to relocate you may find that or, or look if you in the same as opposite is true right if you're like man fuck what kingsbury's saying like i trust my doctor yeah. i trust the science yeah, then, absolutely. Then maybe Texas isn't the spot, or moving to Austin is, or moving to California is. Yeah. And there's a lot of homes available now. And that's what <laughs> that's what makes the United States a really cool place. Like that's it, it the foundation. It continues that way, right? And that's 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 all I'm getting to is like if if we all decide, hey, this part of the country wants to live this way, this part of the country wants to live another way. Yeah. There doesn't need to be a splitting of the country. You can just yeah. be like, hey, we're going to do our thing. You do your thing. Yeah. You know, if you want to vaccinate and the vaccine works. By all means, go for it. I'm not saying don't do it if you fucking believe in it. What I'm saying is I'm not going to do it, and this is why. Yeah, I support that you know? 100%. And don't fucking own... tell me that I have to do it for my kids. Yeah. I don't. Don't tell me that if I don't do it for my kids that a 90-year-old dies in Pakistan. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. It doesn't. You know? So, like, there, there's... That's that's the stickiness of it, and it and it should be... Hey, if you... like, And I've, I've mentioned this before, and I'll quit the ramble, but... My first time going to Kentucky, we were out in the sticks. I was working with um, some former special forces, Green Beret, Marine Recon, and I was the guy working combatives for potentially what would be upcoming courses. And, and they put me through the gauntlet on carbine, pistol, all sorts of cool shit. We fired like 10,000 rounds, and I taught them some of the basics. Uh, I mean, they already knew the basics, but some of the um, combative stuff that I was there. One thing I noticed when we were in town is they had dry counties. This is 2012. I was like, this is maybe 2013. I was like, this is really? How backwards is the South that you can go to a county and they have no alcohol for sale, no alcohol for consumption. You get Mm. in trouble for having alcohol. I was like, this is prohibition. This is fucking nonsense. And now it's the greatest thing I've ever heard of. You can live in a county where everyone agrees, or at least the majority agrees, they're not going to drink there. Yeah. If they want to, they got to leave the county to do so. Yeah. Like, hey, this shit, as it turns out, is the worst drug on the planet. We don't want it here. And if you do want it, you move to a wet county. And if enough people move there that want to change that, they can vote it dry or vice versa. You know, like, like it, to allow those counties and to not have one county going to all the rest saying, no, 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 no. We all need to be dry. Right? Yeah. Like, let's allow that local governance to take uh, center stage to decentralize and to recentralize locally, you know, to find that where, where people can find harmony in their differences yep. and go about the way of life that they so choose. Yeah. Another thing I think is, is valuable is not having the idea that people are evil or bad or stupid or any of those things. I personally think that everyone is doing the best they can with the information that they have. And if someone is choosing a certain thing, it's not just, oh, they are a bad person, you know, that are a product of their environmental conditions and the teachers that they've had and, you know, the, all their experiences and they're doing the best that they can with what they have. And so being able to perceive that person not as other, but perceive them as, as you know, a, inherently a good person doing Doing their best. Bill they're Gates doing they're doing, doing their best. He's doing his good work and through his eyes. I yeah. don't think he views himself as a nefarious evil villain. But the value in that, I think, is that if I project that other villain idea onto you, I am a part of the problem of perpetuating separation. And now 
you will reflect that back to me. And now I'm inherently other because I have othered you. Yeah. You know, and so I, I really love in a conversation like this, which I typically just completely avoid in a public way. Because again, I don't think that my opinion should be listened to in this in this conversation. Maybe, you know, around close friends and whatnot, but in like any kind of public forum, I'm like, I'm not the guy. But the part that I really appreciate is if you are pro this or whatever, great, just don't tread on me. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's that's the part that I think is so freaking beautiful about the United States historically. And hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it stays that way. And that's something that I, I would fight for. Yeah, brother. Is you having your opinion that is absolutely diametrically opposed to mine. I love that so much. And we share a lot of opinions, but in general, when someone has a completely different opinion than me, I'm like, oh, like how refreshing. Because it would be such a, a gray, banal world to live in where everyone's just like, oh yeah, totally, dude. Absolutely. Yeah, a bunch of fucking yes men around you would be would drive you nuts. And having that conflict, that, that polarity is what allows a person to understand what they think. You know, having those challenges and those nudges, it's literally like, it's like sharpening your blade. Someone says, no, 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 you're nuts. Or you're like, oh, wait, hold on. am I nuts? Oh, I got I to gotta check in. Yeah. You know, so I just, it's a different people form of on reflection. both sides of, of the, the political landscape or whatever, I'm like, I'm like, thank you. Yeah. And please, you know, don't infringe on my right to follow my own in- intuition with my own biology that's not impeding or affecting other people. Right. That's a conversation that Terrence McKenna brought up around plant medicine. Certainly. You know? Yeah. No doubt. No doubt. Should we wrap this piece up? We Yeah, we certainly can. What time is it? 11 11 11 o'clock? We've done it, dude. Yeah. I think we wrap it up because I want to go surf still. Okay. Yeah, I feel like... I feel complete. I feel like I'm going to jump in the ocean. We didn't sleep enough last night. We didn't. We didn't. (laughs) We went and did... We had music till... We were out until midnight? I think that's it was 11, so, but we got so home. That's so late for me. Yeah, we were up until... Well, I went to bed at 1.30, and I'm in bed at 8.30. I'm a real old man. Yeah, when you're, old, my sleep you're an older man than I am. I'm, I'm in bed at 8.30. I might listen to Audible for 30 minutes with no lights or read with the red light, and yeah. I'm up at 5.30 to meditate. The occasional bout of sleeplessness or a shit night's sleep has actually been shown from what I've read to be uh, cause a boost in growth hormone. It's kind of like, 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 like a hermetic stressor. Yeah, <laughs> and hard as a rock. Hey, I was hard as a rock right? this morning. <laughs> 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 That's another great indicator of health. Uh huh. Yeah, you want to wake up with a hard on. Something Chuck said in the, in the painting workshop I'll leave us with is libido is not just your sex drive. It is life force energy. Absolutely, man. Life force energy. That's why you sit buying like libido supplements and like, Oh, you mean like sunlight? That's like a boner <laughs> pill. You'd be like laughing, you yeah. know, having like clean having, water. Yeah, those are all boner pills. We had a lot of laughter last <laughs> night. That's where we woke up hard. <laughs> Which that was a good thing, man. Yeah. Like to be to go outside of the boundaries of oh, hey, okay, I'm in bed by ten, up by six. You know, I'll do a little sun gazing. I'll have some spring crystal. Water. It's like sometimes it's like last night we were in the kitchen, the four of us, um, and just rolling laughing. You know, and you were hilarious. You Thank know, you. I'm trying to keep up. I'm not. I'm not funny in that traditional sense as much. You are, brother. I, you are. I, I don't know. Yeah. But it was. It was to me like that moment was just another example of of um, having the flexibility and adaptability to um, be able to be open to moments like that. Because yeah. if you have too much containment and too much linearity and too much masculine maybe or whatever, too much structure, it becomes suffocating. You need to push the boundaries even in the confines of your own rules and regulations for how you live your life, I think. And last night was an interesting example of that. Absolutely. And an invitation for those who have kept away from others. We don't live together. You know, last night was possible because we said yes to being around each other. Yeah. You know, what a funny... Yeah, it seems about about time to to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, That's my... I fucking love you, brother. I love you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I appreciate us, us being willing to, to push each other. Oh, yeah. I appreciate you willing to be open to my continual devil's advocate for 
most things we talk about. You, you sharpen my sword, <laughs> and I don't mean that sexually. I know you're thinking it on the podcast. All right, uh, all right. A, so Align Podcast, Align pod, Align Podcast. Yeah, I'll, I'll put this out this week as well. The Align Method, Align Podcast. Yeah, people, Instagrammers are just going to be Instagram Align Podcast on Instagram. Cool. That's the place. Uh, right. If people on your side, people they probably appreciate the Bruce Lipton episode. Be a great starting point. You know, okay. Bruce Lipton biology belief. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anywho, though. Kyle Kingsbury podcast for your listeners. Yeah. If you want to dive into more living with the Kingsburys, just link to it in the show notes. That's uh, my wife and I's joint channel on the, on the gram. If you're interested in fit for service, for my listeners and yours, we just launched the fit for service Academy app. First month's free. Check it out. No contracts, no nothing. Just see if it's your vibe. People are looking for community right now, a different way to learn. Um, we're going to be featuring great guests outside of the standard coaches of me, Aubrey, Godsey, and Caitlin. And I know we want to do some stuff with you on there, get some content up. Yeah, so anytime we're in the presence of an expert in any field, we want to be able to share that medicine with our tribe. And we've got some really cool things up there, aesthetic dance, breath work, guided all, all that kind of good stuff and ongoing conversations. That's my plug. I should probably comment. Most of the things we talked about today isn't really in the realms of the stuff that I talk about on my no. platform. Most of the stuff yeah. that I talk about is for people that want their bodies to work better. If mm-hmm. you've got back pain or shoulder impingement or neck pain or whatever, we create resources and uh, tangible bite-sized bits that you're people, able to actually digest People know and you on my podcast. Oh, there's, nobody, there's nobody that, like, I know you had said that when you reached out, like, who should I podcast with in Austin? You know, oh, yeah, like, 10 people fun. say, yeah. check out Kingsbury. Yeah, I love that. Everybody knows that I know you from my podcast. Oh, that's good. Yeah, you're okay. a regular brother. Okay, good. All right, that. I love all right. you. Peace I love out. you all. Goodbye. All right. That's a little like it. I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. If you did, you can share it on the internet. Instagram would be a likely place. You could tag me at Align Podcast. You could tag Kyle Kingsbury at Living with the Kingsburys. I appreciate y'all keeping an open mind as we traversed various different controversial topics during this. And uh, hopefully it was supportive to see two friends playing devil's advocate amongst each other. I think it's a really supportive way to approach life and relationships in general, to not just always be a yes man nodding your head, but uh, actually challenging each other's ideas. I think if you are in the room where everyone is saying the same thing and you're just living inside your own echo chamber and you kind of choose your relationships based off of people thinking the same as you, I think that is dangerous and problematic. So I recommend getting around some people that can challenge the way that you think like Kyle does for me. If you guys are interested in learning how to cultivate your breathing practice in order to regulate your mood, if you are feeling stressed out, there is a way to breathe in order to calm your nervous system down. If you are feeling excessively calm and you want more energy, there are ways to breathe to stimulate greater amounts of energy. We break some of them down in the six-week Align Method online program, which can be found at alignpodcast.com slash courses, alignpodcast.com slash courses. It is on discount. Originally, I think it was $250. It is presently $97. And uh, people have been digging it. I so greatly appreciate the reviews that I get on Instagram and Align Podcast. And uh, it's just awesome getting to see you guys be supported by something that we created. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. I look forward to speaking into your ear holes next week. <laughs>